All right, I want to welcome those that are watching my YouTube videos uh, to probably one of my most special guests I've had. And I don't do many, but uh, I, I was talking to Darren Starwin, uh, who you're going to be introduced to here in just a moment, uh, originally about his new book, Awakening the Avatar Within, a roadmap to discovery or uncovering your superpowers. I don't know exactly what the subtitle is. It's Awakening the Avatar Within. There it is. <laughs> All right. So, Darren, you know, you and I have had some chats uh, before this, and we've been going back and forth, and you originally contacted me uh, after seeing some of my stuff, and you realized that we have a lot of stuff that's parallel. Maybe mm -hmm. we're going down parallel highways. May, this may be Highway 99. This may be 101, but it's, we're still going the same direction. We we're are. Not, not crossing each other. So it's about time that the universe crossed paths with us. And let me kind of give you a semi-introduction here, so to be fair to you, because I know you're an acupuncturist, you're into Chinese medicine, and uh, you're also a light worker, uh, uh, a knight of, of, what are you, a knight of? I'm a knight from the Sacred Medical Order of the Knights of Hope, which is an international spiritual organization that goes back to the, like the Middle Ages, basically. Well, sir. So we get. So we get. <laughs> for Starwin. All right. So, but a lot of people may know you from your first three acclaimed books, uh, reclaiming your calm center, which is basically about health and mental health, spiritual health, and all physical. I assume, and then your microcurrent electroacupuncture book, which we'll talk a little bit about, and then the healing, the root of pain, which I think we've been both helping people with because right. you and I both know because people come to us with either physical pain, mental pain, or spiritual pain. And we both know the center of all that it always gets back to the spiritual, right? It's always, that's the foundation of all pain. So you, if you don't, if you don't take care of that part, it, it doesn't make any difference. Right. So, uh, that's not a very good introduction, but for my veterans, if they hadn't been watching this, I hope they are. Um, you're doing some unusual, unique, and beneficial things for PTSD. And so let's start with your own personal introduction. Uh, anything you want to add that I left out, because you've got a life that's all over the place. You've been to India, studying ashrams, you've done all kinds of stuff. And so I, I've given you a gentle stroke, and I hope people will be curious to find out more. But tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this healing stuff. Well, you're right. Experiences all over the place, all over the world. And one thing that's kind of unusual was that when I was only 19 years old, I went to India and spent several months there with a guru and who was actually younger than me. He was actually only 13 years old at that time, and he had something like a million followers all over the world. So that was an interesting time, and there was a, a war going on at that time between India and Pakistan, and I found out later that the United States was aiding Pakistan, so the Indians didn't think that kindly of us at that time. That was back in the early 70s. And that really started my life on a whole different trajectory than most young men. And I spent my whole 20s living in these ashrams all around the United States, um, basically just doing service projects, meditating, and developing that side of myself. I later realized I hadn't developed myself emotionally very well during those times, so I had to make up for that in my 30s and 40s. But basically, it all sort of caught up eventually. But I, I feel like from a very young age, even way before that, probably what's most relevant to this conversation, Bill, is that from a really young age, even probably preteen, I remember just fantasizing about there was some kind of energy that came through me that could just help heal the world. And I never spoke about that to anyone because no one in my family was into anything like that. You know, they're mostly a kind of intellectual East Coast Jews who weren't really into spirituality in any way. But I always had that feeling that there was something in me that could do that. And I kind of just forgot about that when I got into puberty and got older. But it was always in the background that there's something in fact, what I used to fantasize the most would be to go into mental hospitals and take like the most, the worst cases of people with like mental illness and schizophrenia who are like just locked away on drugs and somehow 
miraculously heal them so that they would become these shining kind of people. I don't know where all that came from. It just was feelings I had as a young person. And then uh, I went through in the 1960s what a lot of people my age did, you know, trying to use drugs to find a way to reach these higher states of consciousness. And after a few years, I realized "Eh, it ain't there. I mean, you get these little tantalizing glimpses, but that's not really the path. And so, again, when I was only 19, I went to India with this teacher and got very deeply into the practice of meditation. And I've never really stopped. I've just continued to explore different forms of meditation and different kinds of personal growth. And I'll admit, I did it because of my own inner pain, because I was feeling such an alienation and so cut off from a lot of the things I wanted in my life. And it was kind of like, I experienced my youth as like this painful gap that I sensed that there was this bigger reality of higher consciousness and sort of master healer abilities, but I didn't, I felt like I was cut off from that, sort of exiled into my left brain and a lot of repressed emotional issues that I picked up from my family. So it was a real search for how I could heal myself and then I and then always like, well, how can I bring this to others? That's kind of what's driving me when I was young, I guess is a good way to put it. So it was mostly all the spiritual work. And then, like I said, I had to develop my, my emotional maturity more as I got out of that, that celibacy ashram period and got more into my career, which as an acupuncturist and I became an inventor. And actually this machine you see here is not one of my inventions, but if you, I could tilt this thing down a little bit, let's say the, the, the device you see down in the lower shelf is my invention, that's called the Accutron. And I helped develop that with a team of engineers back in the early 1980s and spent 25 years going all over the world teaching about this and introducing healthcare professionals into using energy medicine, which is energy medicine is using energy as medicine, as you might imagine. Now there's instead of, um, now, now, is this, now, is this electrical currents that this machine is, is producing? Yeah, what, what that, um, these are both energy medicine devices. The one at the bottom is the one I, basically what it does, it uses what's called microcurrent technology. And what that does, it uses extremely tiny currents in the millionth of an amp range. So you, you won't even feel it in most cases. You wouldn't even know you had it on you. But the, what's unique about that is it uses specific patterns of frequencies And I'm sure you know this, Bill, and so many people listening to this, that each frequencies are messages of information to us and that each frequency holds a certain piece of information. So it'll run series of frequencies and uses different colors also, different colors of light to inform the body about ways to regenerate itself and relieve pain and relieve trauma and PTSD and actually to make the body look younger. That's another one of the things it does also called facial rejuvenation. So when I met some people when I was younger and a guy was using a tuning fork to help people heal, that time I'm going, yeah, okay. That guy wasn't too far off from what you were doing electronically, huh? Well, not at all, because tuning forks is sound healing. And so, I mean, the human body responds to sound frequencies, light frequencies, which are often thought of in terms of wavelengths, different colors, and then electrical frequencies, which is a much lower level than sound and light. And then, of course, there's more cosmic frequencies and subtle energies, and there's there's like, like a huge like orchestra, like symphony orchestra of frequencies that we are bathed in 24/7, and we're we're not only receiving all these frequencies. Like let's say something like astrology. People talk like I have a close friend who's an astrologer, so they talk about how Saturn and Jupiter and different planets and galaxies are affecting us. Well, it's really affecting us because there's subtle energy frequencies that affect us and that we are these super sensitive energy transceivers which means that the human body is way more you know the the subtle energy instrument than we realize we're receiving all these frequencies from you know the world the environment the weather distant planets and galaxies you know your your ex-wife or your ex-husband whatever it is how about how about this this has got (laughs) i got that up my ear am i doing anything am i affecting my health well, you're cert- it certainly is putting out some very strong frequencies, and unfortunately, some of those are very harmful to the bo- human immune system and to you know our brain. And I think we also have protective frequencies that we're generating that hopefully neutralizes them, as much of that as possible. I try not to think of the gloom and doom because most of us use these cell phones these days. 
All right, so let's let's jump a little bit. Because your first your first three books that I know of, I don't yeah. know how many you have, yeah. first three major books that I know about all deal with health at different levels, emotionally, spiritually, physically, in the healing process and pain. Now this new book, which I've been kind of perusing and going through, this takes this is a whole new roadmap, a new highway. This is really going someplace else. This is almost like putting information in people's hands so they could heal themselves? Am I kind of gathering that? Am I over reading that? Well, that's absolutely true, Bill, healing themselves. But it, it even goes, it takes it to another quantum level. Like most people, when they think of healing themselves, they would think of, okay, I'm going to eat a better diet and exercise more and perhaps take the right herbs or cut down on sugar or, you know, or think better thoughts. And these are all definitely a big part of healing yourself. I feel like this book, um, Awakening the Avatar Within, it's it's taking it to a quantum level. And I want to I don't want to use that in a vague term. I want to tell you what I mean by a quantum level specifically. Is you know, quantum physicists have been studying subatomic particles for um, you know over a hundred years. And and looking at and what's like kind of like what is really going on behind the scenes of our reality. And what they find is something very different than our traditional physics used to talk about, like Newtonian physics and how our minds think it is. And that basically, this is probably, what's in this book is probably the most radical level of healing yourself, I would say. And, and what I, why I say that is because I'm basically saying in that book, which is information I've received from so many sources, is that the ultimate form of healing is knowing your true self. And your true self is an avatar and what avatar is the definition of avatar comes from a sanskrit word that means avatara that means the divine power of the universe descending into a human form in order to do to rock the world and do some kind of big purpose that's what an avatar is so i'm saying the ultimate form of healing is not just you know finding out what your mother did to you when you were a child or you know what you know overcoming the trauma you had it, it that's these are pieces of it but when you realize you are the divine in human form, nothing less than that, and that anything you think, you know, your problems, your, your you know, the, 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 the neuroses, the, all the strains and struggles we go through are simply because we are not fully feeling and knowing our, our avatar self. And because we're clearing a lot of stuff too, we're serving by clearing a lot of the pain of this world, that that's, a very high form of healing is knowing the true self and and not just believing it because I know so many people intellectually you know there's so many books about self-realization and about you know non-dualism and I've read probably more books than there are grains of sand on the beach but um, it's more really about experiencing it as an actual feeling as an actual like light inside yourself and that's what this book brings people into well, I, I was fascinated just just go just going through the chapters. Yeah, the stuff you're dealing with. I thought it was interesting because because you know I'm dealing with veterans and PTSD and all that, and I've always come to the conclusion that well, it's not just veterans got PTSD, and, and 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 it's almost like they transfer it to their families. But there's also people out there, and you and you put the words there because I had the thoughts, I just didn't have the words. But you oh. talk about the fact that maybe there's 12 million diagnosed people with PT, hardcore PTSD, but there's a low grade version of that that most of us suffer from. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, thanks for asking about that. That's a, that's a really key thing, <clears throat> is that we what, what seems normal to us is actually a very low state of consciousness in this world. And because, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's, there's an old saying that, that, that from Arabic saying is there's no such thing as hell because you could get used to anything. Like if, you're, if you grow up in a hellish experience, it just seems normal to you and you have your ups and downs within that, you know, that low level of consciousness. It's, you know, there, according to the Vedas, the ancient scriptures from India, there's been these giant cycles of time where in other ages, the human race was at a, pretty much everybody was at this high state of enlightenment and that was our normal, where you know, people lived for much longer periods of time, we didn't have disease, you know, people just with their thoughts could just command the elements and we, you know, live in harmony with the earth. And it was, that was our new, but somehow for reasons I hope we get a chance to talk about here today, 
the human race has descended into this very low level where the whole experience is. And so, and, and, and you add to that the fact that there is a certain group of people on earth, I'm going to call them, you know, for want of a better word, the, uh, the dark forces or the elite or the manipulators or the, whatever you want to call it. I've heard them called the cabal, but there's a certain group of people that have tremendous wealth and influence and have, sci have been using all the modern technologies and ones that we don't even believe exist to basically um, consolidate their control. And a lot of that is, you know, to create even more stress and pain than people would have normally and create even more of a divide between the ultra rich and the poor and, you know, you know more pollution on earth and, and, you know, so many things like this. So somehow if you bring all these factors together, it's, it's sort of like the whole karmic experience of the human race for thousands of years is all coming to a head right now. And the ancient Mayans had a way of explaining it, which I also have in one of the chapters of my book. It comes from the work of um, Mr. Kalaman, who's you know a great author, wrote about the um, you know the work of the, the the Mayans, and they basically said that since the Earth was created, we've gone through these quantum waves where the universe would send certain frequencies to Earth, and then life would take a huge leap upward to another level. So to cut to the chase, we are in what's called the ninth wave right now which is a time where all the different experiences that the whole um, Earth has gone through since it was created and all the human race is all happening now. Like it's all bombarding us now. And it's truly overwhelming, you know, to us. And so I'm, I'm giving you all the reasons why we have low grade PTSD. So as a result, everyone on Earth is experiencing this, this post-traumatic stress, like experiencing now, there's, I, I mean, I, I know that there's people that have it much more severely that are diagnosed with PTSD and are on medications, they're on high risk for suicide, you know, domestic violence, substance abuse, and a lot of these people have come back from war, they've been through rape, they've been through, you know, terrible, you know, uh, things going on in their areas. And so those are the extreme cases that medical science recognizes. And I'm saying the rest of us have this low-grade PTSD because we're so bombarded with so much information and so many things coming up from our subconscious mind and from the outside world that it's normal just to feel sort of stressed out and feel nervous, have trouble sleeping, have a certain base level of anxiety. And so, and a lot of that translates into a lot of physical diseases like high rates of cancer, heart disease, and so on and so forth, Alzheimer's. So this is a big subject, Bill, this low-grade PTSD, because it seems like our new normal now. And what I'm talking about in this book is a way that we can step out of that. Any person can free themselves from that and actually experience. And, I, and, and, and so the big question is, how do we, how would we free ourselves from that? Isn't that a major thing? You know, it's easy to say, talk about this theoretically, but there is a how, there is a way to do that. And to me, it, I've been in holistic healing for all most of my whole adult life as an acupuncturist and as an energy medicine practitioner and doing quantum healing. And I know there's so many wonderful methods, you know, in acupuncture and chiropractic and massage and um, psychology and, you know, using um, you know, psychedelic substances and proper, you know, there's so many different healing systems that are people are using now. I think they all, they, all of them only go to a certain extent, like they all will work on maybe the physical level or balancing your energy or helping you reduce anxiety or get in touch with blocked memories. There's, there's all that. But to me, because things are so extreme on our planet now with this bombardment we're all going through, it takes something. There's only one kind of like, I like that. They said, this is a job for Superman. You know, I, used to, I used to watch that show. Well, this is a job for something that ultimate form of healing and that ultimate form of healing and, and this may, I'm going to take my time to explain this because this is an easy to say, but it may take a little bit to like develop this because it's a new idea for most people. We all have something I call our unique energy transmission. Our unique energy transmission. And I, like right now, I just want to take a moment to, I, right now, like I feel when I do these broadcasts, I often feel like there's a transmission that comes through me or is associated. So I just want to ask whoever's listening to this now, just to tune into your own feelings right now. Like the feeling in your body. You know, we actually have 
even though we were, our minds may be very active, we have feelings in our body, and our body is this ultra-sensitive instrument. So just notice what you feel now. Because this transmission that's coming through right now is what's called activation. It's something that awakens and activates this stream of divine energy that's flowing through you. You have your own... See, we each of us has a certain way that divine energy and frequencies flows through us. And I call that your transmission. And in, in this, I, I say it's unique because every person has a slightly unique way of expressing that. And it's a lot like a symphony orchestra. Like every, par, par, every player in the symphony orchestra has their own part to play. But when they all play their part beautifully, you have this wonderful sound. You know, that's the sound of... So, so, if, so when we get in touch with our unique energy transmission, it is the ultimate healing for PTSD, for trauma, for unresolved depression, anxiety, and feelings of blocked potential, like you're not living up to your potential, which I've dealt with that a lot in my life, or, what, or you know, lack of immune system function. Like all these things people struggle with. I feel like the ultimate cure is getting in touch with your own energy transmission, which is the divine expressing as you and through you. And this is not something people talk about that much. You know, you know that, that's why I'm kind of taking this kind of slow because I don't want it going one ear and out the other for people listening to this. Well, well people well, watch well, this on my, on my YouTube channel. Some of those people have heard about it, but you're going to get veterans watching this because I got a lot of veterans yeah. out there. They don't know about this, so I appreciate you explaining it a little bit. Well, uh, Bill, I'd love to hear like what that means to you, Bill. Like, because I mean, you're obviously in a similar wavelength. You talk about that parallel path. Like, what would this thing about this transmission? How would you say oh, that in your words? Well, I, I tell you what. I, I know there's different the body and the energy. Because I once upon a time, many a few decades ago, I didn't really believe in acupuncture that much. I thought, well, you know, like it it could reduce pain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but can it cure? Can it change things? And I was at a Self-realization fellowship church in Sacramento, and the usher was uh, an acupuncturist. I mentioned to him I had a frozen shoulder. I was going to get surgery, but it was like yeah. frozen. I couldn't move it. And he goes, "Well, come on in my office. I I can work on that." Because he was in Chinese medicine. And okay. And I thought, I said, "Well, the pain I can handle. Pain. I'm a tough guy." He goes, "No, no, I work on it." So I went in disbelieving. So it wasn't a placebo effect because I was going in. And I was I was. Okay, I'll give this guy a chance. So he sticks the needles in me. Now, here's where I'm talking about the energy differences. Yeah. Stick these needles into me. And as soon as he stuck them in and left the room, I, because I've had 100 acupuncture treatments. Okay. And I've never had experience like this in the next time. It was painful. And nobody has pain from acupuncture. Just that's it. But it was like I was getting electrocuted for a half hour until the guy came back. It was like, so he came back and he, he started pulling all the needles out. And then you could confirm. Tell me, explain to this. We took them out, and every needle was shaped like an S. They really? all, okay. every single needle bit. And he was going, "Oh, wow, wow!" And he's putting them on tray. Didn't want to throw them away. He was going to do a paper on them. And I was, and I said, "Man, just." Like, and then I realized my shoulder was free. So then he goes, "I'd like you to come back for a treatment next week." He says, "You got any other problems?" I said, "Well, I get some migraine. Great, come on in for your head." Same thing happened. Two weeks in a row, we bent the needles, and so when he pulled them out took a little tiny magnet that was no bigger than a head of a pencil. Mm -hmm. little tiny thing. And he was sticking it on my finger, one of my fingers someplace. He was just holding it there. And all of a sudden, the side, my side of my ear my, was like heating up. And it was like, wow, what, what are you doing? You're burning up my ear. And he goes, wow. He says, theoretically, theoretically, that's part of the body that's supposed to, you know, affect. This little magnetic, you know, thing was affected. He says, but... He, he tapes that on somebody and they wear that for months, you know, and they never feel it. But within many seconds, just as soon as he put it there, I was in, it was active. So I'm thinking the fact that my energy, quote unquote, was blocked, whatever that means. And, and then when it burst forth, it, it bent the actual needles. Uh, and then the, the, the demonstration with the magnet, uh, I, I became a way being a firm believer that each of us have a unique power system and that there really is, if the energy is messed up or blocked or not functioning correctly, uh, it was causing me problems. So 
you can address that. It's not that's nothing to do with your book, but yes, and, and there you go. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. Well, that's a that's a great example of of energy. And energy operates on many different bandwidths within us. So I think the energy you experienced with those needles was chi, which is which is sort of something that's sort of semi-physical and semi-energy. That's like a Ted Kapchuk, who is a man who wrote a famous book about acupuncture, said, chi is energy on the verge of becoming matter and matter on the verge of becoming energy. And that was a famous quote he did. So I, I think you had a lot of energy that was bound up in your body that had, wasn't circulating well. And he, this guy was skillful enough that he put the needles in just the right places in the right way that you had these major releases that felt like being electrocuted, you said, and bent the needles and that it, you, it, it, you, there, you obviously had some like big charge stored up in some parts of your body that was causing you pain that you weren't getting out and he helped you to release that. And then there, so that, that's, that's a certain level of energy. And then this transmission I'm talking about is, you might say a much more subtle en level of energy than that, but actually ultimately powerful. And so all these, and then there's the physical, like this, like our physical body is energy too. In other words, you know, Einstein said E equals MC squared, which means that energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. So if you speed up the vibration of matter, you get light. So basically this is also a form of energy that slowed way down. And then the energy you felt with those needles was an energy that was at a higher frequency. And then this uh, spiritual transmission energy is like at a much higher, and they all work in harmony. Like, well, that's what, we're these amazing machines that have all these levels of energy in us. And if you heal one level, it often tends to ricochet to the other levels, is what I've found. So I was wondering, after you had that experience, did you notice anything different in the way your mind or your emotions felt? Do you notice anything like that? Well, if you, if you read enough of my stuff and watch my videos, I've always been kind of in this psychic highway that nobody's on but me. Yeah. Uh, I'm finding parallel people that are traveling. But uh, yeah, it, it, I had a unique life, so stuff happened. But yeah. obviously there was a blockage there someplace in me, and, and, and it kind of it opened up a, a period of health for me, so that was a good thing. But I really do believe in, in this energy stuff that you're doing, uh, especially in reference to like all the reading I did about Yogananda him talking about that's the future medicine, what use of electricity, currents, you know. And I, so I'm thinking he was seeing it in the terms that you are, but explaining it in 1940s language, right. you know, electricity. But I think he was really talking about the currents and energy you're talking about. Yeah, I, I certainly read his book and found that quite remarkable. There's, I, I keep coming back to what's going on on our planet right now, like, like because there's the microcosm and macrocosm, like what goes on inside of each one of us, like inside of our own emotions, inside of our own, what we call our problems, our issues, or our strengths. We are in holographic relationship with all life and this is another one of these things, which is one of these mind-blowing realities that quantum physics has confirmed, that everything is interconnected. Everything, it's called quantum entanglement. So when you went through release of that pain in your shoulder, you were affecting everybody else on the planet by doing that. Did you realize that? <laughs> yeah, I believe in the one, the theory, I call it the theory of one. Yeah. And, and so, so let's say we talked about that low-grade PTSD. So... If you're feeling stressed out on some level, anybody who's listening to this, you're going through a hard experience, and that what you're feeling is you're actually part of the stress, part of the PTSD is not just your own. You're actually feeling some of the heaviness of what's going on to the whole human race because all of us are these sensitive transceivers, you know, receiving and transmitting. And on the same thing, when you raise your consciousness in any way, like when you go through some kind of healing that's significant, you're literally lightening up the load for everyone else too, and all life, and it even goes beyond this earth. And so this is the kind of stuff that kind of takes the top of your head off, but it's it's really true. So in, in so all these great philosophers, spiritual leaders and teachers, they always tell people, if you want to heal others, heal yourself first. Mm -hmm. Is that what they're talking about? Heal yourself first, forgive yourself first. Love yourself first. Yeah, it does affect others. It it really really does, and in some ways you can even see that logically because if somebody forgives themselves and becomes a nicer person, 
they're going to be affecting a lot of other people just in simple practical ways that anybody can understand. You know, they'll probably smile at more people or they'll be less, less irritated or less annoying or whatever the case is. But it goes way beyond that. Because again, like we are in holographic, holographic again, to redefine that term, hologram is a system where any point in the system contains the entire system. So this one physicist, um, Nassim Haramein, who's very well known, I saw this statistic that he wrote, which is completely mind-blowing. He said, in one proton, which is a, a particle within an atom, the entire universe is contained within that one proton. And he has mathematical equations to prove that's true. And so, so in the same way, like if one of us goes through some kind of healing experience where you feel like you open your heart more, you, you let go of some grudges, you forgive somebody who you weren't forgiving, and you, you're kinder to people around you, or you make up with your spouse or whatever it is, you are literally sending waves of healing out to the whole world. And so, and but of course, on the other hand, people who are doing things which are, you know, sending out negative thoughts and are, are dwelling in fear and paranoia and, you know, hurt, hurtful things to others or manipulating others, that's going out. So we're kind of at this battle going on on the planet now. There's a battle between the light and the dark on a certain level. That's right now, we are in the thick of this. And that's why things seem so crazy in so many ways. But, but the one thing I want to say about, even though that battle is going on, there's the higher level we call the fifth dimension. And the fifth dimension, there is no battle going on. There's only pure love, there's only pure oneness. And every one of us is in that fifth dimension. We just usually are not trained to recognize it or to see it. So we don't think about it much, but it's also there. So like, you know, in the old days, we used to, when I was, I'm young, I'm old enough to remember radios where you'd actually turn a dial to go to, <laughs> that's probably such a passe technology now, but it's a good analogy that our minds are like these radios and we can tune it to a frequency that's more like on the wave of all the PTSD and stress and worry and all that fear of what's going on. That's, and then you can turn it to a different frequency where you're in the fifth dimension, which is not a cosmic, psychedelic, weird experience. I mean, it may be cosmic. It's not, it's not a bizarre, it's a very normal experience. It's like just the feeling when you feel good, when you just kind of feel optimistic, you feel good, you feel like love comes to you easily. That's the fifth dimension. You know, it's not some strange thing. It's just a question of how much do we attune to it. And when you attune to it, you're helping everyone else attune to it. So how did you find yourself attuning the entire frequencies? Through meditation, through what? Practices of various kinds? What did you discover when it improved that for you when you were younger and, and, and now? What was your pathway? Mm -hmm. Well, I've, there's a, that's a big, a big answer to that. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Is that I really feel like every experience I've had, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, which I think was a Clint Eastwood movie, um, <laughs> has has brought me into this. Like in other words, this, yes, I've done. A, I started meditating regularly when I was 19 years old, and I was interested in consciousness even when I was in high school. I'd read different. I, I read every bit of science fiction I could get my hands on because I felt in science fiction there were all these messages of higher consciousness that are kind of hidden in the story. So I read that. But I feel like yes, the meditation really helped by helping me to know my calm center and that's what my third book's about how other people how you can claim your calm center and get to know that and make it become comfortable with it but, but i also feel even the humiliating traumatic experience i've been through helped to bring me into this too because all the experiences do i mean that's kind of one of the the reason i'm saying that is because those experiences help to kind of bring me out of some of my fixations on on ego-based motivations, let's say, that were more selfish or more just based on um, things that weren't resonating with my higher soul. So like those humiliating experiences really helped me in a way. Sometimes I've said, thank you, God, for all the humiliation I've been through. <laughs> because if I, I, I feel like if I had grown up, let's say, having everything I thought I wanted, I probably would not be have written this book, I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing now. I'd be probably, you know, out there in the corporate world or, or inventing things or whatever it is, but, but not as much in my genuine self. So I feel like the beautiful experiences, all the meditation, you know, all, I've, I've had a lot of teachers too. I've um, studied with a whole succession of, of very high level teachers. And I, 
sometimes I've wondered why I'd go to, I wouldn't go to one teacher for a few years and I'd go to another one, is what I feel I was doing is I was gathering data. Like every time I was, I'd learn what I needed to learn, I'd put it into my inner processor and my soul level consciousness. And what I feel has happened in the last few years is like the last say, seven or eight years is that everything, all those experiences have kind of coalesced into like a, a sort of clarity or a, like a feeling of clarity of what I'm here to do. And more of this feeling of this transmission coming through me that is I can see creating miracle results in my clients I work with way more easily than what I used to get in the days when I was doing acupuncture. So I would say that to anybody listening to this, it's not just the fun experiences and the what we call the spiritual experiences that bring you into your higher purpose. It's every experience. Well, if you listen to my videos, I was talking about look for the gift. It's not yeah. what happens to you, it's it's the gift that you find from it. So right. Even Absolutely. cancer can be a gift. You can learn something from cancer, you can learn something from pain and suffering and from war. Everything teaches you something. If you and you can pull the, the gift from it. And that sounds like we're on the same wavelength, different language, that's all. Yeah, that's not very much the same wavelength. One, of my, one phrase I speak about in this book, Awakening the Avatar Within, and that I think is really worth considering is a phrase called accepting for value. And I first heard that term in terms of finances. It's something from the financial world. And it's so, I won't gonna go into the whole meaning of it, but it's, basically a way you switch debt into assets, accepting for value. But as the years went by, I started realizing it applies to our experience, to our spirituality, just as much as it does to money or to material things. But what it means is you get to a place where every experience you have, you look for the value, you look for the gift in that experience. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to see the gift when somebody's nice to you, right? It's easy to feel like see the gift or, you know, when you make a big sale and a commission comes in, or, you know, you get together with your relatives on Thanksgiving and it's a nice, you know, those are, it's easy to see the gift on that. But what about the times when things seem to be big losses or you mentioned having cancer or you go through, you know, physical pain or your best friend dies or, I mean, how... It's a very controversial thing to say that those are a gift. In fact, I've pissed a lot of people off by saying that. Or in the club. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pissed off okay, by saying there's a gift in all your experiences because many people are very, in, you know, get, you know, indignant about that. How can well, they you own it. They own that. It's yeah. a, you know, don't, don't take it away from me. Don't take away my pain. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Awakening the avatar within. Let's 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 start with the obvious because you talk. about the people will listen to this, and nowadays, young people are playing all these, they think of an avatar, you know, in a, in a computer right. sense. I know what you're talking about, but in general, can you explain to us how that title, uh, using avatar, the avatar within, how does that apply? What does that really mean? Are we talking about the price consciousness or we're higher? What, what, what are we talking about, the avatar within? More, well, thank, more you. thank you for asking, yes. The, well, the avatar within is your true self. And I know that's a phrase that's used a lot, so I should like, explain it a little bit more. Specifically, an avatar is the divine power of the universe, which is an ultimate power, ultimate love, and ultimate knowledge, omnipresent, omniscient, you know, and all the things we talk about with God, divine, no matter which religion you come from, there's some description of an ultimate power. It's that ultimate power manifesting in a human body for a specific purpose. So I'm going to say that one more time. An avatar is this ultimate power, love, and presence of the universe manifesting through a human body for a specific purpose. And so we know that there's been famous avatars, Jesus, you know, one of the most greatest, you know, being, the people, he had more effect on the human race than probably anyone else in, in history in terms of, there was one man who lived and did his ministry for allegedly just a few years. And now of the 8 billion people in the world, by close to half of them consider themselves to be a Christian or connected in some way, you know, respecting him. Even this, you know, Muslims respect Jesus as a great teacher, you know, Sufis respect him. You know, so, so basically that's an avatar. Okay, we can see Buddha, um, you know, again, he, he sat under a tree for a certain amount of days and had an enlightenment experience and then spent the next 30 years or whatever it was, you know, teaching. Um, Kuan Yin, 
uh, you know, this, this, this woman who lived in ancient India or wherever she lived, somewhere in that region, and as an example of her compassion, has now there's statues of her all over the world, and you know billions of people worship her and look to her for comfort. These are avatars. I mean, we see that. And then there's people that are, let's say, more like Martin Luther King or um, Gandhi, or you know people that weren't necessarily thought of as you know on that level. They're maybe more politically based what they did, but still, these are avatars. These are people that, in their life, they created tremendous, massive change in huge numbers of people. Another example of an avatar would be the Beatles. I seriously think here's four lads from Liverpool who you know, played music for a certain amount of years together, and now, several generations later, the young people still devour their music and they change the consciousness of the planet, or literally. Some kind of power came through the Beatles and there was many other musicians you know, that, as well. So an avatar is, is some is a person or maybe a small group of people that are changed the world through their presence because the divine they're expressing divine power. Now, I've also put in my book that there's dark avatars. Like there's people that there's there's avatars that do what seems to be tremendous evil in the world and and change the course of history. And an example of that would be this man named Genghis Khan. He was a a, a Mongol who lived in the 1200s. And he actually was an orphan. His parents were killed by the, you know, by warring tribes, and he was trying to survive as he, as a boy, out in the steppes of Mongolia. And he somehow got a few followers together and won a few battles and built this army. And then his followers swept over the entire Asia and into Central Europe, and did horrible atrocities to millions and millions of people and created this giant empire. And so we could say that he was really evil what Genghis Khan did, but he changed the course of history. And as a result of what he did, Marco Polo came in and all this trade routes and cultural exchanges between Asia and Europe started happening and technologies were developed that wouldn't have been developed and you know, economic things. So there's weak, whether we, uh, we don't, don't have to condone what he did, but he changed the course of history. So there's a lot of light avatars and dark avatars that have come. Of course, I'm focusing more in my book on the light avatars. That's where, where I'm, what I'm aspiring to be and that I think we're talking about. But just to acknowledge that. So it's easy to think, okay, well, there's these great people that did these huge things, but I'm just an ordinary guy just you know, or, or woman just living my life, and I have all these hang-ups and issues and stresses, and I don't feel powerful like that. How could you say I'm an avatar? But in my book, I explain that you are also an avatar. You just It's a question of claiming it claiming that power of who you really are and that means stepping out of the the dream of our society like we have a dream that we all kind of collectively dream together which is of limitation of separation of polarization of death you know, including the idea of death and disease like these are all things that we're dreaming that we're believing and it's a big discussion in itself we could spend a whole interview just on what that dream is and where it came from but it, you have to have the courage to step out of that dream to be to claim your avatar self and even if somebody who's listening to this has felt like really knocked down by life or humiliated like i said i've been a lot of times in my life where you know not your health isn't that good or you feel like I'm, I'm old i don't have the energy to do this you know it doesn't really matter because your avatar self is still totally there it's more a matter of changing your beliefs, like changing your beliefs about your limitations and who you are. And I, I, I want to say something very important, Bill, which is important to me, is that if we move out of denial, we have to admit that this third dimensional physical reality we're in is in a huge crisis. I mean, between the environmental crisis that we're in, global warming, and the amount of pollution there is, it's, and electromagnetic pollution and chemical pollution, and, and you know, how much you know, small elites of power-hungry people have been you know, um, sapping you know, the money and energy from so many people. And, you know, there's a lot, so many crises that are so um, major that are going on right now, most of which don't seem to have a solution. I mean, you know, they went, you know, that we just had that Glasgow environmental conference and all the world leaders came together and they didn't agree to do what's, what scientists say is necessary to save us from tremendous destruction within one or two generations. They just didn't do it because p politicians aren't going to do it voluntarily. So, I mean, we look at all these things and say, what could there possibly, what solution could there be to this? You know, racism is still like a horrible problem in our country. I mean, you know, 
mistreatment of children. I could go on and on about these crises. So I believe that the, the real solution is part of the solution is scientists can bring, politicians, humanitarians, you know, religious people, spiritual people. But there's a bigger solution is a bunch of us claiming our avatar self and really manifesting this divine power that we are. That, that's the one thing that's more powerful than all the, um, you know, the, all the negative forces in our world. And I, that's what this book's about. It's not just to, to inspire people to you know, think better thoughts or to improve their health and a lot of things that are in there. It's to actually awaken to who you actually are. That you, and when we come together, when people who are awakening avatars come together and cooperate and together, that's what I believe the true second coming of the Christ is. You know, many people are waiting for, you know, the this second coming. Well, back at the time of Jesus, they're waiting for the Messiah to come and free them from the Romans and all these things going on. And there was all these people claiming to be messiahs and, you know, it was just a big mess. And then, and so now many people are, many people are Christians are waiting for a second coming of the Christ, like for Christ to come back and to <clears throat> set things straight. But I believe it's not going to be one person this time. It's going to be all of us. It's going to be a big bunch of us becoming, knowing that we're Christ and knowing that we're avatars. And that, that that's what will actually change this planet and solve all these issues. Wow. That's such a good place to, to, to why don't you hold your book up again? We're good. <laughs> Obviously, I want people to read this book and uh, think, Awakening the Avatar Within. Trust me, this is probably a... a I would call it a handbook, you know? It's it's how to if you really looked at it. You're really giving people how to stuff. Yeah. You give the Very theory, practical. You give the theory and then you give them the practical. So and with that I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you. Uh, and I look forward to us meeting we're, we're just down the road uh, uh, what, 90 miles away from me. Right. Yeah. With the covid you might as well be 1000 miles away. But uh, this next year, 2022, we will get together. We'll we'll, we'll meet. We'll share bread. And uh, I'd love like to do that. But our, our philosophies now that we're at the end of this basic thing here, our philosophies are are pretty much in the same basket. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've noticed there's a lot of people I, I really agree, in total agreement with. And each has their own different vocabulary, different way of expressing it. But you know, it's it always gets down to love and if you call it the light you call it energy you call it forgiveness you call it anything you want but love really is the glue that keeps us you know it's us it's it's the uh it's the god within us it's us and we are god whether in or out there is no outside us there's only i, I believe it's just us there's just my theory of one there's one there's god everything else is a dream it's all god's dream but <laughs> So there you go. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, God bless you. And for those out there, I, I hope that you uh, uh, get the book and, uh, and read it. God bless.